One of the many benefits of having interacted with so many traders is that I really get a lot of insights into the various issues that people encounter. So when there are certain trends with this, I can then use this information to help you all overcome certain issues sometimes before they even rear their ugly head. Now, something I've really noticed are the different phases a trader goes through when they actually start learning. Personally, I believe these are different to the phases that are often quoted elsewhere as the stages that you go through, but we'll go into detail about this another time. We'll go through the whole cycle you go through. For this video, I just want to focus on one particular phase, which you might be able to relate to. Before we get going, I just want to say this is an advanced concept, so it will make sense to you right now, regardless of what stage you're at with your trading, but it may not be something you can apply straight away if you're a beginner. But we'll go into it anyway, as it's an important concept and it's something that you can keep in mind for the future. When a trader first starts off, they're obviously clueless about what they're doing, right? This is inevitable in anything. You have to learn the ropes before things start to make sense for you. But slowly, one step at a time, traders will start to learn the basic blocks of what makes up successful trading. If they're learning with us, they'll learn all about our approach and how we use the tools that we choose to use. They'll also understand the importance of sticking to a system because most importantly, this will then allow them to collect data, which they can then use to optimize later and iron out any flaws that they might have. However, what I've seen in a lot of traders when they get to this stage, and once they understand the tools that they're using to a level where they can use them successfully by themselves, is that they start to get very rigid with what they're looking for in a the market. They box themselves in. It's almost like the stars have to align before they can even open a trade. And therefore they're spending all their time waiting for these entries in the market that are rarely going to come. So I want to talk about the next phase after that one, the phase that allows you to have the stars align for you much more frequently. And I think by understanding this next phase, just by understanding this phase exists, you'll be able to reach it a lot quicker. Now, this concept is really tricky to explain as it's something that happens naturally over time, that most traders, they start to develop more of a feel for the market. But as always, I'm gonna try my best to explain it anyway. My aim is always to pass on everything I know to you, whether or not that goes in line with the common norms of trading or not, and whether it's difficult to get out of my head into words or not. So to help me explain this to you, I want to tell you a little story. Now, this is a true story about the famous jazz musician, Keith Jarrett. So Jarrett arrived in Cologne for a show that he was booked on. He'd been performing in Zurich a few nights before, so he hadn't slept much in a few days. I had not slept for two days. I had bad Italian food in a restaurant. And he had to travel a long way to get to this show. On top of all of that, he was wearing a back brace for the back problems that he had at that time. So as you can imagine, the conditions were less than ideal for him. But as a professional, he was still ready to continue and to perform. However, when he arrived, it turned out that there'd been some confusion about the piano he requested. They'd arranged the wrong piano for him. And to make matters worse, the piano was also in poor condition as it was only intended to be used for rehearsals. It was so bad, in fact, that Jarrett refused to play that evening. We went to probably tell the engineers that they could leave because it was just, everything was wrong. The promoter of the concert was a 17 year old girl, Germany's youngest concert promoter at the time. And she was absolutely distraught about the idea of Jarrett not playing. She was in tears. Now, obviously a crying teenage girl is not a good idea. It's not a good situation at any time. So it's very difficult to say no to them. So Jarrett reluctantly agreed to play because he didn't want to let down the teenager. But he and his sound engineer decided to record the performance because they wanted to keep evidence to show future promoters what can go wrong if you don't arrange things correctly, right? It's a bit of like forward guidance for them. The venue was filled to capacity. It was the first ever jazz concert to take place at Cone Opera House. So Jarrett goes out and performs with this dodgy, poor quality piano. He struggled his way through the show. And in fact, it was so tough on him that you can actually hear his groans in the recordings as he struggles to get the sounds that he wants. However, the audience loved it. It was unlike anything they had ever heard before. The recording was then released as an album called The Cone Concert, 
and it went on to become the best-selling solo album in jazz history and the best-selling piano album of all time as well. Now this is an absolutely true story. You can look up the album online and you'll see the story for yourself. I originally heard the story told by Tim Harford, who I've recently referred to before in one of our videos on innovation. Harford used this story to show how unbelievable innovation and creativity can take place in situations of absolute chaos and how chaos is therefore not something to shy away from but to embrace. However, for me, this story also shows you how far you can push your limits when you truly understand the foundations of something and you can use this to achieve a much greater performance. You see, when Jarrett had to make these adjustments, it led to him like hammering on the keys to get the sound out loud enough and he had to create some rolling bass lines to get some resonance out of the piano. But since he knew what each individual component would achieve for him, he was able to be more creative about his use of them in a different way to normal. And that meant he could have some flair to really express what he wanted to happen if it was a normal piano that he would use. And so this is what I see as the next phase for traders as well, whether they realize it's happening or not. So what I'm about to talk to you about, you might listen to and think, no, surely that's not the case. But it's something that happens in anything, not just trading, right? I'm not saying this is something unique to trading. It's just what happens when you get good at a skill. And that's why it's so important that we understand that we're learning trading as a skill. It's not a one size fits all set of rules that you've got to follow, it's a skill. Now this concept, I used to explain it by giving examples from sports. So let's start there. So for example, in basketball, you learn the different passes, you learn how to dribble, how to shoot and so on. But once you become exceptional at those fundamental basics, you can start using them creatively and express yourself more. For example, an alley-oop is effectively just a basic pass to the backboard, followed by a rebound catch and a dunk or a layup. This is taking the basics and using them creatively in a certain situation to achieve something which might perhaps not be a possibility otherwise. This happens in a lot of sports. The person might get so good at what they do, they know the fundamentals so well that they can then elaborate on them. And you might even ask them, how the hell did you even know to do that? And they might not be able to give you an actual answer. They don't know. They just understand the activity that well. Or think about an artist. They'll spend years learning the basics of different brush strokes and different techniques. And they might learn how to do life drawings and landscapes and all kinds of things. Before then, you end up with someone like Picasso, who can use these understandings to bring something completely different to the table. Now, obviously we can't all be like Picasso in trading, but this is sort of like what we're doing with our trading when we know our foundations. So you have to understand the tools that you're using and the analysis you're doing, and then from practice and racking up a lot of screen time, you can start to develop a real feel for the attributes of the different interactions of the tools that you're using. You can sort of understand what's gonna happen. Of course, each time it will be slightly different depending on the context of the market, but you know what to expect. You know where the risks lie. You know what you can get away with before you're pushing the boundaries a bit too far and deviating from your system. So essentially, you're taking your trading from a static set of rules and tools to a much more fluid understanding of the market. You're basically transitioning to really understanding and using trading as a skill rather than a distinct set of rules to follow. Just like any other skill or any other profession or any other activity, developing to a professional level. Now a question that often comes up from this topic is how do I know if I'm deviating from my system? And how can I track the specific criteria I use to open a trade? Well this is where we go back to Keith Jarrett and his Cohen performance. Now you might start thinking that without structure, and without being that rigid, then you're just going to make things way too chaotic. But that's really not the case. That's what a beginner trader does. They manage the chaotic market with their own brand of chaos and it's just chaotic altogether. But you're going to be taking the chaos of the market, which we can't help, that's how the market is, and you're going to be matching that with organization. You see, Keith Jarrett, he might have had to make certain adjustments when he was playing a piano. He might have had to do things that he wouldn't normally do and it was a bit chaotic, but deep down, he was organized with how he was doing it because even though he was making these adjustments, he wasn't going outside the remit of usual musical principles. Likewise, you might be making adjustments to how you approach the use of the tools in the market, 
but whatever adjustments you make, whatever way you approach them, are still going to be within the remit of how the tools and concepts work. So I wanted to avoid this video getting really long. So I was at the end of this one going to be showing you examples so that it really solidifies what you've learned because I know this has all been theoretical up until now. It's a bit difficult to learn when you're just hearing words. You need to see it on the charts. But I don't want this video to get super long. So we're gonna leave that for part two. Part two will be out next week. We're gonna go straight into the charts. We're not gonna do the theoretical part. We're gonna do the practical part and I'll show you clear examples. So that will help you understand it more. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss out on that one. If you have any questions about this, which I'm sure you will, leave them below. But as I said at the start, it is an advanced concept. So if you're a beginner, then don't worry if it's been confusing. If you're advanced, uh, if you've been trading for a while, don't worry if it's been confusing as well. The example is gonna help. So thanks for watching, I appreciate it. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.